I'd like to thank John Mikheya um, for stepping up and doing this talk. Uh, last time he gave a very interesting talk on why certain gases are greenhouse gases and others aren't. And some of the same physics applies to his current talk, um, which is lasers and the ultimate non-thermal device. So I'd like to introduce John. Okay. Please take it away. All right, let me uh, share the screen. Do you see, do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, the topic is lasers, the ultimate non-thermal devices. Uh, I should point out that uh, uh, I, first time I have seen a laser was when I was a sophomore in 1969. And uh, I was just taking my first quantum mechanics course and I was told that laser was a sort of quantum mechanical device. And when I saw it, I was absolutely fascinated by this this is a helium neon laser with a red light, this intense beam, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, the professor kind of uh, put a little bit of chalk dust into the, into, the, uh, into the air so you could see the beam itself. Uh, it, 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 it was an experience. I kind of, uh, I decided at that point that I, that's what I wanted to study, you know, uh, when I was going to go to graduate school. I wound up, uh, in graduate school, not studying lasers directly, but studying some of the laser processes. So uh, let me go down to the, let's see, I, I for some, okay, here, here I go. This is the context of the, of the discussion. And before we talk about the non-thermal devices, I think it's worthwhile that we review what are the thermal systems. And we'll use Boltzmann distribution to do that uh, because uh, I think Boltzmann distribution actually uh, was is sort of the mother of all of the other distributions, and uh, it it's a classic it's a classical uh, theory which was developed in uh, uh, mid 1800s. So it really it was applying to a classical motion of uh, atoms or molecules in a gas. Uh, so one of the relevant questions since laser is a quantum device is to ask, do quantized energy levels follow Boltzmann distribution? And uh, we will go through that and then we'll go into do a little bit of laser theory. And we'll show essentially that the requirements for laser to laze are you compatible with the Boltzmann distribution? And uh, this is why laser is the non-thermal device. And I'll go over why I consider it to be sort of the ultimate non-thermal device. Then we'll go through uh, one particular laser, which is carbon dioxide laser. We'll go through how it works, the physics of it, and how to construct one. Uh, after we have done the CO2 laser, we will uh, just sort of go through generalized laser processes, which all lasers have to follow in order to, to operate. And we will complete the talk uh, going through some of, some of the history highlights of the laser discoveries and also other lasers and their uses. And now my, okay, okay, here we go, all right. <coughs> so, Let's assume we have a volume of gas in a thermal equilibrium. So we have atoms and molecules sort of moving around at some, some velocities, bumping into each other, undergoing collisions, some elastic, some non-elastic. So some molecules will lose energy, some of the molecules will gain energy. And gas in thermal equilibrium has a whole range of energies, which is what we call a distribution. And that distribution is, uh, was first formulated by Ludwig Boltzmann in 1960, 1868 during his studies of the statistical mechanics of gases in ther thermal equilibrium. And it, essentially, if we assume that we have a number of gases in, let's say, upper energy, E2, and that number we'll call it N2, and then we have another gas, a number of molecules at lower energy, E1, and that number will be E1. 
the Boltzmann distribution states that the ratio of numbers of excited states versus num of numbers of molecules in the lower state is equal to given the, by this exponential. Where the delta is a difference in energies between the higher energy level and lower energy level, Kb is known as a Boltzmann constant and T is a temperature. Since delta E is by definition positive, Kb is a Boltzmann constant which is positive and temperature is positive, it has to be, if it is physical, then we have exponential of a negative number. So that number will always be less than one. It, at the, at the one extreme it will be equal to one, but it's always less than one. So in the Boltzmann distribution, we have always situation where number of molecules in the excited state, in a higher excited state, is always smaller than number of molecules in lower excited state. And then motonically decreasing exponential is also called affectionately Boltzmann tail. Uh, physicists do have a sense of humor sometimes. So now the question is, can the Boltzmann distribution to be extended to discrete quantum states of gases? As I said, it was basically Boltzmann distribution was formulated using classical, classical statistical mechanics prior to the quantum theory. So the question can be also rephrased. In a gas, do discrete quantum energy levels obey Boltzmann distribution or do they follow another distribution function? One can rephrase this question saying, can you have a single volume of gas which holds simultaneously two vastly interested non-interacting temperatures? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm getting a flashing window here. Do you see that? Okay, it's gone. Uh, so can we have a volume of single volume gas which holds simultaneously two vastly different non-interacting temperatures? One will be the classical temperature, which we now know. It's a basically called translation temperature where things move around. And the other will be quantum temperature, which will basically contain either rotational, vibrational, electronic states. If you remember my talk from last year, we talked about atoms, uh, atoms having electronic states and molecules having electronic or vibrational states. It turns out that mole molecules can also have rotational states uh, those, the energy of rotational states are about order of magnitude lower than those of vibrational states. So we will answer this by examining the distribution of vibrational levels in vibration excited nitrogen. Do you see, excuse me, do you see this window that says please? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm not sure I can get rid I it, cannot it, get rid it of it. It sort of so. comes and goes. I will just okay. continue. All right, we'll just continue. Okay. So consider vibration inside nitrogen molecule. It turns out that it can be produced in prodigious quantities by electron impact in a discharge. N2 has almost anomalously large vibrational excitation cross-section by electron impact due to a phenomenon known as electromolecule scattering resonance. I don't want to go into the details of what the uh, scattering resonance is, but I would like to point out that, that, uh, that the resonances have been discovered in early 1960s, and they explain in most part why certain atoms or certain molecules have a very anomalously large cross-sections uh, imp from in electron impact by excitation. Uh, one of the uh, good examples of, of the uh, uh, atom scattering resonance is, is resonance in mercury. Turns out mercury has a resonance uh, by electron excitation, and if electron hits mercury at certain energy, it, it is more likely than not to excite it, uh, to excite a state. That mercury then would uh, uh, basically decay to, uh, to the ground state by emitting by editing photon, which is at ultraviolet light, and this is a basis for a fluorescent tube. That ultraviolet, ultraviolet light hits phosphor in a tube and makes it glow. So, so electron scattering resonances are very important in, in the scattering theory. Turns out also that nitrogen does not, in an excited state, a vibrational state does not radiate. Uh, my, uh, 
you may remember again, I, I went through these arguments in my last talk, the nitrogen molecule does not have a dipole moment, so there is no radiated path for, for the vibration excited nitrogen to return to the ground, ground vibrational state. Because the nitrogen does not vibrate, uh, I mean, it does not decay to the ground state, it is also, it makes it a difficult uh, uh, gas to analyze using optical method for the uh, uh, distribution of vibrational states. And in terms of the boson distribution of vibrational states, one has to use a basic, different techniques than the standard spectroscopy, spectroscopy technique. It turns out the boson distribution of vibrational states has been confirmed using Raman spectroscopy and electron transmission spectroscopy. I know precious little about the Raman spectroscopy, but I'm quite familiar with the electron transmission spectroscopy because this is what I was doing when I was a graduate student uh, for my thesis. So at the risk of, com of committing a cardinal cell sin of self-citation, I'll show you pages of my, from my thesis, which are kind of relevant to this question. So this shows electron scattering trapped electron spectroscopy apparatus. What we have is, and it's a very, uh, very simplified diagram, but we have is essentially electron gun, which produces energetic electrons into a coital monochromator. It's a beam of electrons which enters the collision chamber where it is uh, then intersected by a gas which we are trying to analyze. And then it's analyzed in the retarding analyzer electron beam collector. The entire, uh, the entire uh, thing is put inside of a high vacuum. This is why we have a diffusion pump, because we want to only analyze the collisions between electrons and the gas under study. We do not want to analyze uh, uh, collisions between electrons and the background gas which might be in, 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 the, in the vacuum chamber. Attached to this vacuum chamber is a gas delivery system which contains a pyrex tube, which extends itself beyond uh, into the vacuum chamber. And in pyrex tube is surrounded with what I would call a kind of a shroud, which makes sure that, that most of the gas which enters the gas is into, the, uh, into this tube gets pumped out to what we call a roughing pump. It's basically a mechanical vacuum pump. And the only small section of that enters the the ultra high vacuum system enters, enters collision chamber in form of a jet. For this experiment, we have also placed a micro, microwave cavity to bring down the gas. So we let nitrogen in. Nitrogen gets broken in the microwave cavity where lots of vibration excited nitrogen is created. Uh, then it flows through this tube and uh, Part of it gets sampled by electron beam where it gets analyzed. Uh, we have measured the transit time between the time uh, gas break, gets broken down and, and time the, the gas gets hit by the analyzing electrons, and it's about two to three milliseconds. So this particular tube here is about, it's not to scale, it's about two to three feet long. So without going into the details of uh, what a trapped electron uh, method is, I would like to show you the data that we have obtained from using uh, on a vibration excited nitrogen. The experiment here is shown in dots. And the theory is mainly a fit into the spectrum using some published optical data for excitation of these particular states uh, using photons, using basically optical data. The data has been published. Those are essentially calculations uh, from uh, using Schrodinger's equation in case of nitrogen. Uh, the, uh, each one of those vibrational states has its own particular envelope of, of, uh, of peaks and by varying different ratios of V equal zero, V equal one, and V equal two, we can actually get the best fit into the experimentally obtained uh, uh, data. And it, as you can see, the, this fit here is what I call externally very good. I mean, it's, 
I was actually concerned when I showed this first time to my committee that they were going to accuse me of, of fully rounding the data, uh, try to make it fit. But this is a real data and a real fit. Uh, there's nothing fudged, uh, you know, I haven't fudged here anything. Well, we did this measurement many times, we found out, and this is stated in the highlighted text, that during the fitting of the spectra, it was observed that in all cases, the best fits of the relative vehicle zero, vehicle one, and vehicle two populations were obtained when vibration populations were given by a Boltzmann distribution. So that for me is a pretty good proof that, uh, that quantum levels of at least nitrogen gas and those of vibrational levels followed by uh, follow uh, uh, Boltzmann distribution. So here we have a situation where we have a gas whose temperature we measured using the speed to be about 2450 degree Kelvin. At the same time, if I put my hand on this tubing here, where through which gas flowed, that tubing was barely warm, uh, very, very warm to the touch. We measured the temperature to be about 40 degrees C or 330 degree Kelvin. So we, here, we, here we have a gas whose vibrational temperature is about 2000 degree Kelvin or centigrade higher than its traditional temperature. So I think it's a pretty good proof that quantum levels will follow Boltzmann distribution, although, you know, as I said, Boltzmann distribution was really written for classical systems. So now when uh, we create the vibration excited nitrogen, the question is how do you bring it down to the uh, ground state? The process of, we call that process quenching, and it has to be done by, it will not radiate because it, is, uh, it does not have a dipole moment. It, so it has to be brought down to the ground state with a collision with something. And those would be either surfaces or another molecule of the gas. From our experience and experience of others, we found out that metal surfaces are good quenchers and glass surfaces are good quenchers. What does that mean? If I have a metal tip thermometer, such as a thermocouple, and I stick it into that gas that I just uh, that we, that I just showed you. Basically, we, me we measured 2,400 degrees temperature. The metal thermometer would read 2,400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. On the other hand, if I use a classical uh, old-style mercury th thermometer, where mercury is enclosed in a in a glass bulb, so only glass is exposed to the uh, to the gas, I will measure translation or kinetic temperature of 40 degrees centigrade or 313 degrees Fahrenheit. So, yeah, so, depend, so sometimes reading a temperature of the gas, uh, you have to be very careful what kind of uh, device, you, what kind of thermometer you use. Uh, turns out that carbon dioxide is also a good quencher for nitrogen. Uh, this leads to a CO2 laser. It also has some implications on global warming, although, those implications are kind of small, but, uh, but we, in, in, uh, in the atmosphere, particularly after events such as the thunder and lightning, you will create a lot of uh, vibration excited nitrogen, which will probably mostly get quenched by CO2, which then radiates back to, uh, it's, uh, it radiates back to Earth, and uh, the energy for, of, for, of the uh, lightning would then basically uh, get transferred to the uh, to the surface of the earth. So these are the Boltzmann distribution takeaways that I uh, that I have. The definition of a temperature of gas as it roots in the Boltzmann distribution. Boltzmann distribution is applicable to both classical and quantum systems. And if number of molecules uh, we call it N sub B at energy E follow the Boltzmann distribution, the system is considered to be in the thermal equilibrium. If there are deviations from Boltzmann distribution, the system will be considered non-thermal or it is not in thermal equilibrium. And last part, which is very important, Boltzmann distribution does not allow number of molecules at high energy le and the level to be greater than molecules at lower energy level. Uh, if you look at the formula, this could happen only in non-physical temperature 
thus in Bolson distribution, number of lower energy levels is always higher than that of, of high energy levels. Now we'll go into to discuss what are the requirements for laser to operate. Laser is an acronym of light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And one, one of them was, we see this, we can say, well, what is a stimulated emission of radiation? And in order to, uh, to, to, to talk about stimulated emission of radiation, we should really talk about absorption emissions photons passing through a gas. So let's assume that we have a gas which has two states. One is a ground state, one is an excited state. And, we illuminate, and the difference between these two states is delta E. And we, have, we illuminate this gas with photons whose energy also happens to be delta E. The, gas we inter the photon will interact with the gas, and when that happens, we will have a series of absorption and emission events. And we'll go through, some, uh, through, these, uh, through these events one by one. First absorption. We have an incident photon of the energy which is equal to the difference between ground state and excited state. It hits the gas and it promotes essentially electron from its ground state into the, into the excited state. And in the process, the uh, incident photon gets absorbed. So at the end of absorption, we wind up with no photon, but we wind up with atom in the excited state. Now we have something called spontaneous emission. Uh, it's, we start, excuse me. We start with the atom in the excited state, such as, for example, you, you could get during the absorption. And that uh, particular atom in the excited state will stay in that excited state for a certain amount of time. Usually it's very short. And, it's spontaneous, and then it will spontaneously decay to, down to the ground state while emitting the photon of energy, which is equal to the difference between the excited state and the ground state. So this is spontaneous emission. Now that brings us to something called stimulated emission. That's a third case. And here we have a situation where we already start with the excited gas, where the electron is promoted to the excited state. We, come, we hit it with the electron whose energy delta E is equal to the difference between the ground state and the excited state. That photon will perturb that electron in the excited state and cause the transition of the electron to go from higher level to lower level and emit the, in the process, and emit another photon. So what we wind up here is a gas which is in, uh, which is in a ground state, but we get two photons. We have gotten the gain. Here we started with one photon and we now wind up with two photons. The interesting thing about these two photons is that they are identical. They are identical in frequency, they are identical in phase, and they are identical in polarization. In a, in a laser lingo, we would say that these photons exhibit, are coherent. They are basically indistinguishable from each other. Uh, they act like one big photon. So if you look at this now, we have started a gas which had some energy, in during stimulated emission, we have taken that energy out of a gas and created two photons. So we have gotten amplification. And if you look at the laser acronym, it's, it's an amplifier. Laser, uh, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So we are here basically on the right track for the laser. In order to find out what it will take to get actually gain out of the uh, out of the gas which uh, uses stimulated emission we have to go through uh, so the rate equations to find out what's the rate of absorption and what's the rate of stimulated emission and and uh, what conditions the absor the the stimulated emission will be stronger than rate of absorption so the rate stimulated rate of stimulated emission is given by this formula it's a change in upper energy level with time, which, is, which equals negative of lower energy level, because in case of stimulated emission, we lose electron in the uh, upper level 
and we gain le uh, the electron in, in the ground state. And that's proportional to a constant, we call it B21, times the intensity of incident light times the de de density of, uh, of atoms or molecules in a higher level. If you look at the rate of absorption, the equation is very similar, except the constant is now B12. It's a little different constant. The light intensity stays the same, but it's now proportional to the number of molecules in lower level because we are absorbing molecules, promoting molecules from during absorption from a lower level. We are uh, stimulating uh, uh, electrons from the higher level. So the proportional constant constants B212 and 21 are known as Kaistan coefficients for absorption of emission and absorption, and the row is the radiation intensity uh, of, of photons on the gas. If we look at this, these equations uh, again, we see that they are very similar with few exceptions, with few differences. One of them is the rate of stimulated emission is proportional to the number of molecules in the excited state. A rate of absorption is proportional to the number of molecules in the ground state. Well, Einstein simplified it even further because Einstein so, showed that the coefficients of absorption must be the same as the, for, for emission. So the, the B21 and B12 are identical. Since these, two equal, uh, since these two constants are identical, that means that the absorption and stimulated emissions are reverse processes proceeding at somewhat different rates, one proportional to the number of the density of an excited state, one proportional in the number of uh, atoms in the ground state. So now we can try to find out what it takes to get the power out of the, out of the gas, which is excited and is undergoing stimulated emission. Well, the, red, the net rate of transitions from excited state to the ground state in a stimulated emission is given by basically by uh, adding the respective rates of the emission and and the uh, uh, and the absorption, and that's equal to the Einstein constant times intensity of incident light times the difference between the number of excited states minus uh, states in the ground state, which is basically given by this formula where, where number of excited states minus uh, uh, ground state is given as a delta N. So now if the net power released by this gas uh, during the stimulated emission is given by number of, by the rate uh, uh, of the, of the transitions times, uh, uh, times energy of each photon, which H is H mu. So in order to get the gain out of this gas, delta N has to be positive, and number of excited atoms has to be greater than number of atoms in the ground state. That is known also in the laser lingo as population inversion. So the takeaways from laser theory are as follows. Lasers are quantum devices whose operation depends on well-defined discrete energy states. Lasers operate on a principle of net positive stimulated emission where there are more atoms and molecules in the excited state than in the lower level, and that is known as a population inversion. So laser is a non-thermal device where the N2 is greater than N1. And if you compare it now to, to the Boltzmann distribution, we show that the Boltzmann distribution N1, which is number of molecules at lower state, energy state, has to be always greater than the number of molecules in high, high energy state. And for the, uh, for the laser operate, the opposite has to be true. So we have a paradox here. And the solution to this seeming paradox for gas laser is uh, basic collisions where energy is transferred selectively. It's not transferred across the whole spectrum of energies. So we will go now through uh, operation of CO2 laser to show you how you can get 
uh, population inversion in a gas and uh, how you make, you make it laze. Now, CO2 was invented by Sikumar Patel in 1964, I believe. Yes. And uh, those who have been in Bell Labs for, for quite some time who may remember Sikumar Patel uh, retired from, from Bell Labs around in late 90s. Uh, he was executive director of research uh, when he retired. He went on to become a vice chancellor, vice chancellor of education in the University of California system. Now, what I show on the left side is the uh, energy diagram for both nitrogen and uh, and uh, and uh, CO2, and I am showing basically the vibrational levels uh, of both nitrogen and CO2. Vibration. Uh, uh, the nitrogen has is a diatomic molecule. It has nearly evenly spaced vibrational levels. I show here the uh, first vibrational level. The CO2 is a little bit more complicated. It's a triatomic molecule, so it has a different ways to vibrate. Actually, four different ways. It can uh, you can have an asymmetric stretch. You can have two modes of bending, and you can have a symmetric stretch. So it has four vibrational levels as opposed to one for nitrogen. The asymmetric stretch is the highest energy uh, 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 vibrational level. The, the, other two are, the other three are lower energy. Well, what Patel has observed is that the first vibrational level of nitrogen is nearly coincident with the asymmetric stretch of CO2. He also observed that vibration excited nitrogen is easy to make in a discharge. He also knew that vibration excited nitrogen has very long lifetime because it does not have a dipole for radiative, uh, uh, basically, uh, radiative uh, quenching. And CO2 can radiate because it has a dipole moment. So this is basically the CO2 process sort of shown in a, in a, schematic. We start with the, with the discharge where the electron impact promotes electron in, uh, in nitrogen to first vibrational level. Now this molecule will live long because it cannot radiate, so it will bounce around until it hits CO2 and transfer its energy to the first vibrational state of CO2, asymmetric stretch. Now, asymmetric stretch, because uh, it is asymmetric, it, it, uh, it actually has a dipole moment. So, the, uh, so CO2 can actually radiate into the lower vibrational states. And if, if, we, have enough, uh, if we have enough collisions between the vibration excited nitrogen and, uh, and the CO2, we can actually invert this population of this level relative to the lower levels, vibrational levels of CO2. So now we have a lazy, uh, lazy phenomenon where the CO2 basically uh, radiates down to either one of the bending levels of the, uh, of the C of a molecule or another to the symmetric stretch. So one radiation is at 9.6 micrometers uh, wavelength, the other one is a 10.6 micro, micro uh, micrometer wavelength. Uh, now we can see that if we do this for long enough time, we will populate these levels sufficiently that we will lose our population inversion. So one of the parts of, part of, the, uh, of the laser process is to depopulate these levels, and that's being done by either radiation, which is from bending, bending uh, the uh, the bend mode of the uh, of the uh, CO two has a dipole moment, so it can radiate. The symmetric stretch of the uh, of the CO two cannot radiate because it's again symmetric and there has no di di no dipole moment. So we have to help this transition to uh, to come to the lower level by allowing collisions with either uh, either with other gas such as helium which is often used to 
speed up this depo depopulation process, or we can actually have uh, CO2 hit the tube, the wall of the tube of the laser, uh, of a laser, where it will hit the surface of, a, of the laser and it will, and it will depopulate. So now we will show you how we will construct the CO2 laser, given that we know how to how the the physics of the CO laser of the, of the CO2 laser. We started with a glass tube, one to two millimeters in diameter. We all make openings for the gas vents, make openings for electrodes. We cut endings of a tube at Brewster angle to make sure that the light is perfectly transmitted through a transparent window surface. The, uh, these windows will be made out of transparent material which have uh, their own dielectric constant. The discharge itself will have its own dielectric constant. If you have a light which is incident on uh, uh, if you have light that's produced in, in, let's say, air, and hits a glass, which is dielectric constant, uh, different dielectric constant than air, you will see a, you will see a partial reflection. For example, if you look at uh, some of the pictures which have a glass uh, uh, glass windows, you, if you look at the picture, you see reflections of the light, and sometimes you, you almost see yourself in that in that picture. That discontinuity in the dielectric constant causes a lot of infections. It turns out there's an angle under which you can place this window, such there's an angle under which all of the light will get transmitted through. And that uh, angle is given, it's called Brewster angle, and is given by this formula. It's arctangent of a ratio between the dielectric constant of the window versus the dielectric constant of a, of a discharge. In here, we only show dielectric constant of the discharge because we have not placed the window. If we now place a window, transparent window, we have we have the dielectric constant for the uh, for the for the window as well. So we attach the transparent windows to both ends of the tube. And in case of CO two laser, where we are hoping to see infrared radiation from the vibration levels of CO two, that. Uh, sodium chloride is recommended to be a window material. Now, sodium chloride is also known to most of you as an ordinary salt. This will be a crystalline uh, uh, and highly polished sodium chloride window. Uh, well, there's one problem with sodium chloride. It is somewhat hygroscopic. It tends to attract moisture. So in order to have this laser uh, operate for a longer time, we would have to either place this laser in a very dry environment, or we could possibly heat up the ends of a laser, have some kind of a heating mechanism for the, the ends of a laser in such a way that there'll be no, there was no possibility of condensation of water on these windows. Now we attach electrodes to electrode openings. Uh, this is schematic. Uh, electrodes are very simple. In reality, these electrodes will extend, extend themselves to the entire length of a tube. By the way, I should point out that that tube would be typically uh, one to two meters long. But the but the the geometry of the electrodes is one of the design parameters which is left for the laser designer, and it can affect the operation laser very significantly. Now we connect the uh, the gas supply, nitrogen plus CO two, and perhaps some helium, to the uh, to the tube and uh, connect the other to the vacuum pump. This will not be sealed system, at least not at the very beginning, because we are trying to make this device to, uh, to work. So in order to make this device to work, you will have to vary the relative ratios N2 and CO2 and perhaps helium, vary the relative pressure of the, uh, of the gas in a discharge. So we want to have ability to do that. So we'll have essentially flowing gas flowing and being pumped out where we can make these adjustments. We connect the power supply and ballast to the electro, uh, to electrodes. The discharges typically have uh, negative differential resistance. And that's kind of a load that power supplies don't react very well to. They, uh, 
often break into oscillations or they will simply shut down to pro by their protective circuits. So we have to put a ballast, which is typically a resistor, in a series, in such a, and to make this resistance high enough so it will offset the negative differential resistance in the, in the discharge. So that way the load on the, to the power supply will look like a positive resistance and that's the kind of load that power supply is like. Okay, we complete the, the uh, so the construction by putting placing two mirrors at the end of a glass tube. Uh, one will be totally reflective, the other one will be partially reflect, reflective. It will have, it will allow for leakage of about five five to ten percent at most of the light that's passing through uh, through this uh, through this mirror, and that leak, leaked out light will be the beam that we will actually observe. Uh, I should point out that what we have just created, uh, what he created, this, this particular structure, is known as Fabry Perot resonator or Fabry Perot cavity, and that's a base of uh, it's a basis of most of the gas lasers, some of semiconductor lasers, and uh, uh, and and the glass laser, glass lasers, most of the lasers except maybe some of the fiber lasers. So now. We will turn on the gas and close our eyes and say short prayer, a necessary part of this process, and flip the switch. And we will see the discharge in a laser. It does not necessarily mean we will see laser. If you're lucky, voila, we had, we've done it. And now we can actually vary some parameters to optimize the power efficiency of this laser or power output or whatever we want to do with it. If it does not, well, we have to start adjusting parameters such as gas mixture, gas pressure, power, and one more uh, parameter, very important, the distance between these two mirrors. In a laser, we like to have this distance between these two mirrors such a way that when we have a reflection uh, a bit of, the, of the light between these two mirrors, we will have a standing wave inside. Uh, that makes a that puts a laser in a mode where it actually lasers most efficiency efficiently. But you can see that this construction allows us to when when, when you have let's say a uh, stimulated emission event and creates a, an event and some of the photons out of the stimulated emission event get out. They are bounced back by the uh, reflected by the mirror. Well, in turn, they will create more stimulated emission events. The light then they will be bounced back again by mirror will be even more stimulated emission events. So we are building basically stimulated emission uh, intensity with allowing a little bit of to come out uh, uh, as a useful as a useful laser beam. But this is essentially a resonator. Things go back and forth to maximize number of stimulated emissions. And if things go well, we have, a, we have a laser. Now this shows a CO2 laser. It's a 100 watt laser. It's a laser cutter. It's, uh, it cuts a piece of steel, which I believe is anywhere between quarter inch to third of an inch thick. And that's at 100 watts. Now, now that we know how to make a uh, CO2 laser, we can actually generalize the whole laser process to any other kind of laser. So the generalized laser process consists of three stages, pumping, lasing, and depopulation. Pumping is where we start with the uh, uh, material in a ground state, and we pump it selectively to an excited level to create population inversion. Now pumping in, uh, in uh, uh, we have reviewed already two gas collision energy transfer gas lasers. Pumping can be done by electric current semiconductor lasers. One can use a flash tube or another laser to pump, for example, a glass laser. 
or pumping can be done by chemical reaction for chemical lasers, where the resultant, uh, resultants of a chemical reaction are actually uh, in the population inversion. So now we have pumped the material, and it doesn't have to be just gas, it can be any material, lasing material. The material will laze to the lower level, and in order to maintain the population inversion, we have to depopulate the lower levels. And again, the population can be done through different processes. We already reviewed uh, collision de-excitation with buffer gas or surface for CO2 laser that's done for most gas lasers. You can have radiative de-excitation by emission of a photon in ion ion laser. Here's an interesting way of doing it. It's, called, it's dissociation of molecules for excitement lasers. Excitement, excitement laser is a laser based on a chemistry between halide and noble gas. Now, if I put halide and noble gas together, such, for example, fluorine and xenon together, nothing will happen. Uh, although fluorine is a very reactive gas, uh, xenon is a, is a noble gas and nothing will happen. However, the interesting thing will happen if I strike a discharge in that mixture you will actually form a molecule of xenon fluoride. You will form that molecule only in the excited state. That molecule is not stable in a ground state. So by doing this, by forming a molecule in an excited state where ground state doesn't exist, I have automatically made, uh, made population inversion. And when this molecule tries to transition to its, to its ground state, which doesn't exist, it dissociates. So this is a beautiful way of actually depopulating the, uh, 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 depopulating the lower levels, making make sure they don't exist. Because the ground state doesn't exist, I can actually make, uh, I can excite a relatively high uh, energy states in, the, in the, uh, for example, in xenon fluoride, and they would, Come, uh, they will de uh, decay to the ground state, which doesn't exist, and emit, emit very high energy photons. And excitement lasers are basically ultraviolet lasers. And I should point out that those lasers were the salvation of the semiconductor industry uh, for the last 20 years, because those are the workhorses which are used in photolithography pro uh, for the lithography for uh, uh, advanced lith photolithography to make integrated circuits. Another way of depopulating uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, lower levels is by, by phonon creation or creating heat, such as, for example, in laser diode. So now uh, I would like to discuss laser history milestones. Milestones. I realize that uh, some of you uh, may have worked on the lasers uh, before, uh, you know, the, and you have made some very significant uh, discoveries. So I apologize up front. This is very abbreviated uh, history, which I had to basically abbreviate because of time constraints. So if your discovery is not mentioned here, uh, it does not mean it's not appreciated, it's just we have to do it and, you know, we have a time limit here. So, in 1916, Albert Einstein proposed stimulated emission. And uh, we already talked about stimulated emission. About 40, a little less than 40 years later, Charles Town and James Corden produced first microwave laser at 24 gigahertz at Columbia University. This was a uh, my maser, which uh, not a laser, it's a microwave amplification by simulated emission of radiation, and its significance is not that it was. Uh, no, it's. I don't think it's commercially a very useful device because there were you can produce twenty-four gigahertz oscillations some other way, but it was the first uh, device that proved the concept that you can actually have a stimulated emission and you can get a gain out of material using stimulated emission. 
1957, gold, gold uh, coins the word laser and proposes the fabric ferro resonator in his uh, first notebook. Um, uh, we show a fabric ferro resonator in the case of CO2 laser. Uh, it's significant because this is basically the basis for most of modern lasers. 1960, Theodore Mayman demonstrates Ruby laser at Hughes Research Laboratory. So this is the first laser. It, uh, it is a, uses flash lamp to, uh, to get the lasing and it's a pulse device. So again, it's a proof of concept that you can get visible radiation out out of uh, using the uh, uh, using the uh, uh, in, uh, the population inversion. In 1960, Ali Javan, William Bennett, and Donald Harriot of Bell Labs make helium neon laser, the first continuous wave laser and first gas laser. If I may digress a little bit, uh, I know a little bit about this invention because I knew Bill Bennett. Uh, from my days as a graduate student at Yale. Bill was a professor there. And uh, he had a lot of very interesting stories about the discovery of lasers. And he had a story about the discovery of this particular first gas laser. They built the, the, uh, the structure, the helium neon laser, intending to get the red light out of it, which is what we normally associate with the uh, helium laser. And so they created the structure and they just could not make it laser. No matter what they did, it was not laser. They were not getting any visible light out of it. And they were getting desperate. Uh, so before they uh, kind of abandoned this device, they, uh, I think it was Don Harriet suggested that they see if this particular device lasers at any other frequency that may not be visible. So they checked for it and they found out that the, the thing was lazy at all, all this time that they were trying to make it uh, lazy at, at, uh, at red light, it was lazy at infrared. So, it is, so this the discovery is significant because it is first continuous wave gas laser, but it is not necessarily the one that they intended to, to make. As a matter of fact, the first helium neon laser, which produces the, the beautiful red light, was created uh, uh, about a year and a half later by Alan White and they rigged it also at the laboratories. The first semiconductor laser was created by Robert Hall of GE. Uh, it was a pulse device. Uh, it, uh, it was again more of a proof of concept that you can get some population inversion in the laser diode. In, 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 a, in, a, in a diode. Uh, I don't believe it had too many practical uses at that time. In 1964, Kumar Patel uh, makes a CO laser, CO2 laser at Bell Labs. Uh, this, at the time of its creation, was the most efficient and most powerful gas laser made. Also in 64, Joe Gusick and Legrand van Uytert make a first uh, neodymium lag laser, YAG laser. Neodymium lag la YAG laser is essentially a laser, is a, is a glass rod uh, where there are some dopants put in to create energy levels, which then you invert by shining an external light. Uh, and I think they used, I think, tungsten lamps to, to illuminate this, this rod and they got a laser out, out of it, a laser light out of it. Uh, in 65, Casper uh, and Pimentel make first chemical laser. And in 66, uh, Peter Sorokin from IBM and Fritz Schaefer uh, invented dye uh, that can be used for, for dye laser. Now, this is an interesting laser. You basically, you make a dye where, by making a dye, you, a chemistry of a dye, you can actually adjust the dye's uh, quantum levels to whatever you want. And then you put that dye in, in, inside of fabric per, per cavity and you shine a laser at it. At, and you, what happens is the dye will laser at a different frequency than the original uh, pump laser. Uh, so that gives you a certain degree of tuning the laser light 
frequency because depending what kind of dye you use, you can, it's a quick, quick and dirty way of basically changing the frequency of the laser. So you have you achieve some degree of tunability, and uh, in '67 uh, the dye laser, uh, the tunable dye laser, was also invented. This uh, where you actually do it continuously. Uh, it's a, of a very limited range, but it's significant. Significant is that it's a first tunable laser. In 1970, Alfaro demonstrates the first temperature CW laser. Now, I would like to point out that if you look at 1960s, you can see that this was full of activity. Activity practically every year, somebody would come up with some new device, which was basically groundbreaking in this field. Uh, in the 70s. Uh, things are kind of slowed down, but they were still, they were still very active. For example, in 74, the rare right halide excitement lasers were invented. These are the lasers that I talked about, which uh, use a noble gas and uh, halide, such as uh, xenon fluoride. Uh, I was actually in, the, uh, in a conference where this was, uh, uh, this was, uh, uh, disclosed, uh, it created a lot of excitement because people were not very success successful in making uh, continuous wave ultraviolet lasers. And also the, so the, the beauty of having a, uh, a molecule which does not have a ground state uh, just appealed to many of us. In 1977, John Madley operated the first free electron laser oscillator. Now, this is a very different device than all of the other lasers. Free electron laser oscillator uses synchrotron, uh, high energy uh, electrons coming out of synchrotron, and it passes those high energy electrons to something called wiggler. The wiggler is a series of magnets of opposite polarities placed right next to each other. So when you pass, pass electrons by it, the electrons will wiggle, and when, when electrons wiggle, they lose energy and they uh, basically radiate uh, photons. And then by adjusting the, uh, the dimensions of, and, and strengths of these magnets, you can actually make a coherent radiation. The beauty of this radiation is that this is the only X-ray laser that you can make. It also comes at a pretty expensive price. Uh, I am talking about 200 to 300 million dollars the uh, synchrotron included. So there are not many of those devices around. Now just skipping through, uh, 1989, Isamu Asaki demonstrates blue laser, blue, blue LED from gallium nitride. And six or seven years later, Shuji Nakamura of Nisha reports the first blue diode laser made from indium gallium uh, nitride. Uh, that's the laser that you find in, uh, in a Blu-ray Blu uh, uh, player. And uh, you may remember that uh, about seven or eight years ago, there was a shortage of these lasers uh, uh, that actually uh, created a shortage of Blu-ray Blu Blu players on the market. In 2006, uh, John Bowers of California and Mario, Mario Paniccia of Intel announced that they have built first electronically powered hybrid silicon laser using stable manufacturing processes. This is very significant because one of the holy grails of integrated circuit technology is to combine lasers with transistors on an integrated circuit. And this is the first step towards that goal. Uh, this, now we're going to more recent inventions. Uh, in, some of them get kind of esoteric. Uh, Mouth Gather and Siok Hyun, Hyun demonstrated a living laser based on green fluorescent protein. What they did is they collected the green fluorescent protein from the, from the fluorescent jellyfish. They placed the, uh, that green fluorescent protein inside of the fabricator cavity. I believe they, I'm not sure how they supply energy to this, uh, to this protein, but they made a laser. Now, the significant thing about it is that after they were done uh, with lasing, they examined the fluorescent protein and it was not damaged. 
So that's why they said it was a living laser based, uh, living laser based on, on a, a, a organic compound. And last but not least, the researchers from uh, University College London and Sheffield and the Cardiff University reported they grew quantum dot laser on silicon. This is again in an effort to, uh, to create, to integrate lasers with uh, electronic circuits in, in, in the integrated circuits. Uh, that's still a goal of the future. It's not that, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. So now let's talk about some lasers and their uses. Well, we'll talk about first the big hammers. And one of the biggest hammers in the world is National Ignition Facility laser. It's in uh, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Livermore uh, National Laboratory. It, uh, it is uh, basically a team which, is, uh, which has Lawrence Livermore, Alamos, Los, Los Alamos, Sandia, and University of Rochester. And here's a page out of the uh, NIF uh, uh, about their laser. This is called the world's largest and most energetic laser. It occupies essentially the entire building. It uh, contains everything, the laser itself, it has a control room, master oscillator, target chamber. This is basically the research for the nuclear fusion. What they are trying to do is to, to, to ignite, to create, uh, uh, to create a nuclear fusion, fusion by supplying very large amounts of laser energy into a small volume. Now I have a blow up of this particular uh, section so you can read this. So it says basically the NIF's 192 powerful laser beams housed in a 10 story building the size of three football fields. So this is a big device. It can deliver nearly 2 million joules of ultraviolet energy in a billionth of a second closer to the target chamber. Now, if you do a simple math, you'll find out that the instantaneous power output of that particular laser is two petawatts, where petawatt is 10 to the 15th watts, or it's a million billion watts. It's a mega gigawatt, I guess. Now you can compare it with the global power output of all of the electric plants on Earth, which is about three terawatts, or three times 10 to the 12 watts. So for the one nanosecond duration, the output of this laser is 670 times greater than that global output of all of the electric plants on Earth. I think it's pretty impressive. But there is another laser which is in Europe and it's called Extreme Light Infrastructure, ELI. And that laser is in Marguel, Romania, has produced pulse of 200 joules in 25 femtoseconds, resulting in the instantaneous power of 10 petawatts, which is about 3,000 times greater than the global output of all electric plants on Earth. I should point out that, uh, that this particular laser produces pulse in 25 femtoseconds. That's 25 millionth of a billion of a second. Uh, the light travels about seven nano, uh, seven micrometers in 25 femtoseconds. So this is very concentrated burst of energy in a very, very little space. Now it does have a repet repetition rate of one per minute, which is not that great. And I am not sure how useful it is for the uh, laser fusion because of the short, uh, short interval of, of, of time. I'm not sure 20, 25 femtoseconds is enough time to really uh, create, uh, to transfer the energy uh, to, into, the, uh, into, the, into the target, uh, laser fusion target, I mean, fusion, nuclear fusion target. Now we go to the big nice large continuous wave laser. One of note is something called Miracle, mid infrared advanced chemical laser. It's a direct energy weapon developed by US Navy and it can produce 
continuous power of of a megawatt for 70 seconds. Now, if you remember, I showed you the laser cutter, the CO2 laser cutter, which could cut uh, half a quarter inch to one third of an inch piece of steel, and that was 100 watts. This is megawatt. This is 10,000 times more powerful. So this thing will go will annihilate anything on its way. It, it will demolish anything on its way. It will shut down the uh, place. It will shut down uh, missiles. It will uh, probably obliterate a boat uh, which is nearby. It's very powerful and very impressive, and I'm sure that our, the Navy loves that. Now let's talk about the longest lasers. Uh, and those would be the fiber fiber lasers. A uh, 270 kilometer optical fiber has been transformed into the world's biggest uh, laser. And it's an erbium dope fiber amplifier, which are now routinely used in light wave systems to extend the usable range of fiber between repeaters. Now, this is how it works you have erbium doped fiber. And you have data coming in, which will be uh, which is converted to light through a laser uh, through a laser, and you pump a simultaneously. You combine that laser light, uh, which has the data, with the continuous light from the laser diode at 980 nanometers, and that's it's a pump laser. So you basically pump this entire length of the uh, of the uh, fiber. So it delays this, and you want it to lace, uh, you want to have a very weak gain, but not too much of a gain, in such a way that the height of the, the magnitude of the pulses, light pulses coming in, does not appreciably change during the transit through this, through this length at, at the end of the fiber. Uh, I should point out that this is something that's used uh, quite extensively in undersea cables. Uh, where the uh, it is very expensive to put a repeater, uh, and uh, um, the uh, repeaters themselves are also extremely difficult and expensive to replace. I think each repeater to replace each repeater in the fiber optical system of under the cable costs about a million dollars to replace. So there is a great deal of incentive to have as few repeaters as possible in the chain. And extending the range of working range of the fiber is very desirable. Now we have talked about smallest semiconductor laser. Uh, a team, international team of researchers at Itmo University, uh, I think it's in Japan, created a laser which is a nanoparticle of three of only 310 nanometers in size, which is 3,000 times bigger than millimeters and it produces the green coherent light at the room temperature. This again is something of interest to people who are trying to combine lasers with electronic circuits on an integrated chip. And this is another use of lasers. This is courtesy of Walt, who sent it to me. Uh, you can use a laser and to toast marshmallows with it. So, to summarize, laser is a non-thermal equilibrium device. It's a quantum device that needs energy level population inversion that cannot be obtained with a gas or any other material in thermal equilibrium. What it means is you cannot obtain laser effect by simply heating up a material. You have to become creative in obtaining population inversion needed to create stimulate the mission necessary for laser. All lasers operate on principle of stimulated emission combined with population inversion. Lasers can vary in size from several football fields to a nanoparticle. And lasers are becoming ubiquitous with wide range of uses ranging from esoteric, such as nuclear fusion and marshmallow toasters, to a commonplace such as optical displays and laser pointers. And here I have a laser pointer, which is actually not 
based on any of the physics that I have just discussed. And this is the end. So I will be happy to take questions. Now let me just stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John, for that very in-depth talk and uh, comprehensive history of lasers. I learned a, a quite a bit here that I really didn't know before. And it was done in a very clear manner. So I understood every Thank bit you. of it. So <laughs> right. um, let's go for the questions. Uh, the first hand I see is Mitch Erickson. This is probably a very inappropriate way to start a discussion after your highly technical thing, John. But you rattled off a whole lot of petawatts and stuff with NIF and uh, the European one. What the, turn it into an electric bill. What the heck is their electric <laughs> bill? Or, you know, how, many, uh, how many? How many watts? I mean, because and and just to be not t totally ridiculous. Um, uh, you know, I, I spent some time with with the Department of Energy in its latter uh, the latter years of the uh, nuclear weapons comp the old the old nuclear weapons complex, and K twenty five the uh, the uh, uranium diffusion plant down in in uh, Oak Ridge used to draw the equivalent of one nuclear power reactor, and one day they sent a letter off to uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority saying. We're canceling our contract when they decided to get out of that business. Can you imagine, you know, receiving a letter saying, "Well, we're, we're going to cancel our contract for a nuclear power plant worth of uh, electricity." Anyway, any idea what what that translates to in terms of uh, electric meters? Uh, I think it translates to megabucks. But uh, I, you have to keep in mind that those petawatts that I talk about yeah. are over a very short period of time. Right, right, right. So, so. Uh, if you have a uh, nanosecond pulse, you have just, uh, you have, I think, created one or a couple of million joules of energy. Now, to, to, uh, to get a couple of million joules of energy out of your electrical you know, grid is not that expensive. It's all of the periphery that you need to make it run that costs you, cost you, uh, cost you a lot. Uh, but I, I suspect it's very significant. Thank you. I, you know, I, I know it's just a it's just a fun mind game in terms of. Fun. Oh no, 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 that's that's fine. It's yeah. it's uh, I, I I'm sure it's a significant part of the budget. And I can just imagine the meter going. <laughs> anyway, that's right. That's off right. To some more technical questions. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mark Edelman. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, this was a great talk, and uh, it was almost Thank as you. good, or maybe better, than your previous talk to this group. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, I I have three questions, and I'm I'll just present them to you. You don't have to answer all three. Okay. It's not fair. Um, right. But uh, my biggest question is. Do you know of any natural phenomenon, natural process that is or resembles a laser? Uh, interesting question. And I asked the same question of Bill Bennett uh, in 1973, I think. And his comment was that he, that a lightning could create a laser in the process because you create such a massive amounts of, of vibration excited nitrogen and you have a CO2 in the atmosphere. So you'll create population inversion. Now, given that you are not going to get a laser device because you do not have this fabric perocavity with the mirrors back and forth. So you'll get some population inversion, you'll get some lasing, but it is not going to be a nice continuous beam. It will be all scattered all over the place. So that's, that's uh, you know, we, we asked Bill Bennett, can you think of a situation where this occurs in nature? And that was his answer. And I think 45 years, or for, uh, almost 50 years later, I don't think that there are any new uh, new sources of that, but uh, it's, a, it's a good question, right? Well, can I just follow it up by sure. asking you, uh, 
I don't know what a quantum dot is, and you mentioned it. Can you can you give us a brief description of what a quantum dot is? It's a quantum dot is a very small structure. It's a small a small enough structure that the quantum effects will start taking place. Uh, you you can have uh, potential energy wells in such a structure, which lead to a whole slew of quantum effects. And what these guys were able to do is to, to create a structure which actually gives us something that looks like a population inversion in a piece of, on a very small piece of material. Uh, that's all I can say about it. I'm not really familiar with quantum dots. I don't even know what a laser structure looks like. But and, it's basically uh, something that's very tiny that, that you are crossing from the classical realm into the quantum realm. realm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, one more. I, I know I'm not really being fair here. That's um, fine. Uh, do you know or can you tell us in, in the uh, ca communication cables, undersea cables, and they have repeaters, how do they get power to the repeaters? Well, they, when you have a, when you have a, a, fire, fire, a communication cable, you actually have fiber and you have, you deliver the power through the metal. Uh, uh, you, ha you have wires essentially. I think uh, uh, the uh, sheath of the uh, the metal sheath of the fiber cable I think actually carries current. Uh, the uh, you have to supply a relatively high voltage at one end because you have resistive drops. No, this this wire continues for miles and miles and miles. And one well, of the is that, uh, let me interrupt you. Doesn't that imply? that you have to have power transmission, electrical power transmission that goes at least halfway across the ocean? Yes, yes, it does. And as a matter of fact, I, I know I, that that created a lot of problems which are totally unexpected uh, coming from AT&T. These electrical fields caused by these wires drove sharks crazy because sharks have a way of sensing electrical fields. And they were attacking the uh, the fiber optical cables because of the, of these fields, so the fiber optical cables in in long haul transmission had to be upgraded to be basically sh shark bite proof. They actually had to redesign the whole cable in such a way that sharks could not bite through it. Bite through it. So yes, uh, on one end of the of a fiber optical cable, you uh, you supply, I suspect, several thousand kilovolts. I'm sorry, th several thousand volts of voltage because you have all these resistive drops along the way. Uh, so you can, because repeaters have their own lasers. Uh, what a repeater does is takes, uh, reads basically the incoming stream, retimes it, and, and, the, and then basically sends it out again. So you need to have a laser which, which, uh, uh, which operates, which is current, uh, and uh, you, Probably need some. You you probably need some uh, um, electronics with it that also needs power. So yes, you do that. Thank Fiber, you very much. But under, underwater sea cables are fascinating field. All right. Or since uh, quantum dots were mentioned, um, I think I saw. Uh, Samsung advertising LCD screens using quantum dots, but I'm not sure if it's the exact same thing that you were talking about in your view okay. graph. Do you know if that's the case or, or not? I, I I know precious little, little about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll go to the next person, John Tomaszewski. Your, your hand yes. is raised. Yes. Hi. Uh after listening to all these uh, thousands of volts that you need to run these things and this uh, very uh, uh, complicated equipment, how do they put all that in a laser pointer? 
Well, laser pointer has uh, has a, uh, a semiconductor. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a laser diode pointer. Uh, you know, it's a laser diode laser. Uh, it's I mean, it's a diode laser. Uh, uh, you could. Uh, it's a very similar structure, uh, except uh, the laser which uh, you put in a fiber optical system has very tight frequency requirements. And the laser diode does not. I mean, the, the laser pointer does not. As a matter of fact, in the um, 1980s, when these things started coming about, uh, being put in uh, fiber optical systems, uh, the, there were great difficulties in manufacturing lasers to specifications, to the frequency specifications needed for the optical transmission. So there was a surplus of, of communication type lasers which just didn't make the cut. And uh, People tried to figure out what to do with them. And uh, somebody said, well, maybe you can use, uh, uh, you can use the laser pointers. The problem is that those, those lasers were not really uh, operating at uh, as frequency of visible light. So uh, that was the idea that, that they would never materialize. It's very cheap to make a laser, a red, a red laser. That's why, you know, it, the uh, laser pointer is, is a couple of dollars, and, and, and the, the laser inside of that is probably a quarter of a dime in cost. But it's similar technology, just uh, the, the requirements are much different. You know, they have, uh, basically, laser pointer just has to lay, so you don't care about its characteristics and, and there's a power output. It cannot be too powerful, but you can control that. But you have no requirements as to frequency and uh, all kinds of you know, coherence and so forth. That's, so it's, it's a cheap device. But you, you, that's, it's, laser pointers are byproduct of a laser research. Okay. As our CD. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, the next person is George Call. Hi, Hi John. John. <laughs> Thanks for uh, bringing back memories. I, uh, <laughs> actually, Good ones or bad ones? <laughs> <laughs> Good ones and some bad ones. Right. Uh, I was my PhD thesis was on uh, modeling the copper vapor laser, uh -huh. and uh, as a side job, I also worked for uh, Gordon Gould. Oh, you uh, did? Yes, uh, and we use we were doing a I don't know how much a military project that was using a uh, CO two laser. But I have the distinction of um, losing the beam, shall I say, and burning a hole in his jacket right through it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Actually, CO2 lasers are kind of dangerous to have around the laboratory because you do not see the beam. Right. And unless you mark where it is, you can walk accidentally into it and you can get severe, you can actually get cut in half if, you, if it's a powerful enough laser. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Don, Gordon, uh, Gordon Gold got himself into a, a really a nasty patent fight in the 90s. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you probably remember that. Yes. That was going to be my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, People in the patent division of uh, of AT and T were very offended by Gordon Gordon Gould's patent because they felt that what he did is something called submarine patent. I don't know if you, you ever heard of that term. Submarine patent is you have a, you had you have a invention which you you apply for for the patent you you do provisional uh, application for this. So you basically mark your uh, territory in this, and then you do nothing until things become until things become developed to become significant, uh, so you can collect significant royalties of it. So there are situations where people invent something and the patent does not get issued for twenty or more years after you have applied for the patent. And uh, when Gordon Gould's uh, patent came out, it was in the nineties, where lasers were very common already. And uh, AT and T was kind of offended by, by because they felt that they had a big part in the discovery of a laser with helium laser, helium neon laser, neodymium, uh, YAG lasers, uh, CO two laser, and so forth. 
uh, and uh, they actually fought. Uh, they there was there were some some companies that fought Gog and Gog tooth and nail on it. I don't know what was the outcome of it, but he, he finally did win. Oh, he finally actually. I'm glad. <laughs> it's not a time. It's, I am no longer working for AT and T, so it's not a company a company line. But I, I thought we deserved it. Yeah. Come back. See, the, okay. the Bill Tittle. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, unlike Walter, I didn't follow it all. But here's my question. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I want to take you back to the Boris Karloff uh, movie, Frankenstein. Yes. I don't know if you saw the movie, but they they raise him up, you know, to, to catch the electricity. Why couldn't you uh, build your two mirrors? I suppose it's completely irrelevant because lightning is a discontinuous, just a, a pulse. Right. You need you need a, an ongoing thing to create the laser. Yes, well, uh, unless you have a pulse laser, lightning. All right. Lightning would create a pulse uh, radiate laser radiation uh, <clears throat> because you would create. Well, actually, interesting thing is that lightning would create a laser radiation which lasts much longer than lightning does itself. Because lightning will create a lot of vibrationally excited nitrogen, which is very long lived. And that vibrationally excited nitrogen would have to find, uh, would, com uh, with, would collide with carbon dioxide, which is in the atmosphere. But if you look at the amount of nitrogen in atmosphere, a number of carbon dioxide, the difference is, you know, carbon dioxide is parts per million, whereas uh, nitrogen is, I think, 70%. Mm -hmm. So it would take a long time for all of the CO2 molecules to, to deactivate these massive, massive amounts of vibrationally excited nitrogen. Well, I was trying so, to find a way to, to, to capture some of the energy of lightning. Maybe it's just ridiculously expensive to do uh, so. I think uh, probably laser radiation would not be the best way of doing it. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Bill, you need a bottle. Remember, lightning in a bottle. That's a yeah, genius. That's right. Right, right. Actually, I had it in my original talk, which I, I kind of took off from my presentation uh, because, uh, because of time constraint. You can ask yourself a question. What happens to vibrationally excited nitrogen, which is created in a, in a discharge? And those, those discharges are massive. So you create massive amounts of vibration excited nitrogen. Well, they will get deactivated. Some of it will get deactivated by CO2, but there's so little CO2 here that a lot of the nitrogen, nitrogen will not even collide with the CO2. Mm -hmm. So what will happen, some of the nitrogen uh, by simply diffusion, uh, vibration excited nitrogen simply by diffusion it will migrate towards Earth and it will collide mm -hmm. with some object on Earth and it will warm it up a little bit. But some of it will actually migrate out of the atmosphere into the upper atmosphere. And uh, it will, some of it will go as far as 100 to 200 kilo, to 600 kilometers into the thermosphere. And there are some papers that I was going to actually show it in the talk, which uh, shows that the, uh, the, there were calculations made on what would be the temp temp temperature of a thermosphere of vibration excited nitrogen. And the answer was, and it would be two to 4,000 degree Kelvin. So you have some very hot gas in the thermosphere, which you do not really see radiating because vibration excited nitrogen does not radiate. It has all kinds of implications on a space travel. Don't travel, don't put your orbit in a thermosphere because you may just not never make out of it, come out of it, you, you will burn up. Mm. And, uh, it also has, you know, vibration excited nitrogen has also, I, I talked to Walt about it. Uh, I don't mean to be evangelist on this topic, but it's a very interesting uh, material because it, it, you have basically nitrogen gas, which has a lot of energy. And it does not, uh, uh, and does not interact with some material. So you could conceivably store this material 
And then the way you would get energy out of it, you would place, let's say, a, ro a metal rod in it, which would basically allow it to deactivate and raise the temperature of metal rod. But nice, so it acts like a fuel. But nice thing about this particular fuel is that if you release it, it does not explode because it is not a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. It is simply a surface reaction. So hypothetically, if I build an airplane which uses engines, which use this particular uh, uh, mechanism of deactivation by vibration excited nitrogen, I would never have to worry about this thing exploding. Even if I had massive leaks or I had ignition summer, it, and also it's non-polluting because you start with nitrogen and the resultant is nitrogen, which is you know, and, and not, not a green gas and it exists in the atmosphere in very large numbers. Mm -hmm. But one will have to do an awful lot of work in order to actually sh show that this concept is technically, technically viable. You have to mm -hmm. you know, know how to make, make this in massive amounts, which is probably doable, but can you condense it? Can you make material that is totally, is totally non-reactive with vibration of sign nitrogen? It's, I, I thought, you know, when I graduated from, uh, from uh, well, left the graduate school, I had a, I was giving a thought of actually doing something with it, but I had an offer from the laboratories, which su superseded anything that I <laughs> might have thought about. Okay, um, Griff finally managed to get unmuted, so okay. please go ahead. Oh yes, we can hear you. Uh, sorry, I had to reboot my mouse. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Is there any practical application for lasers with display devices? Uh, yes. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I'll tell you a story. Uh, I don't know if you heard, heard of Gene Gordon. He was a director in Bell Laboratories. Some people, some uh, Bell Labs alumni may know it. Gene Gordon wanted to make a display where you would have uh, essentially an array of diodes. It was, uh, the display looked like it's, it's CRT, except the front of a CRT would be an array of, of diodes, and you would use a laser beam to activate these diodes. So he would scan the laser beam like you're doing in the cathode ray tube, except that laser beam, instead of hitting the uh, phosphor, which is normally does like in television tube, it would hit a diode, a, a semiconductor diode. And he created this device and it worked. The problem was that he turned those, those, uh, uh, those uh, diodes into lasers by doing it. So you had an array of lasers basically creating an image and it was unbearable to watch because it was so bright. People use lasers for, uh, for, uh, for uh, displays, but it's, but it's very difficult to scan a laser, a laser light at high frequencies. You have to you have some kind of a photoacoustics crystal to do it. And I have seen that thing done, but the, but the, the displays using lasers were not very impressive. So to answer the question, it can be done. I don't think there are commercial products right now. Yeah, probably. I'm, I, I think there would be some difficulty getting the colors, implementing a color space anyway. The, the, uh, don't, the, don't these tend to have very sharp, very narrow bandwidths? Yes, and also you, you don't want to be staring directly at the laser light. That's, uh, yeah, that's that will not do your, your eyes any good. But one thing that I've seen done is they use the laser. Oh, this is George. Uh, they use the laser with a, uh, with, a, a, with a mirror that can be programmed and actually project the uh, laser and... Uh, write things on the wall on, on a building. So what they do is um, they can carry, uh, again, the size of these units now are probably uh, the size of a small suitcase and actually put up uh, um, advertising or uh, political statements. Uh, it's been used a lot 
uh, I think in Germany I've seen it being used and possibly in England. Uh, but what they do again is, so they program their message and it, it's flashed as a banner across the building. Right. Uh, I have, I have <clears throat> seen, if you went to Liberty Desire Center, at least 10 years ago, I have seen some uh, laser displays. But the, the problem I saw with those displays is that the refresh uh, rate on these displays was very poor. Because you, you have a mechanical device which essentially uh, causes the beam to scan. And then you you know you 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 modulate the uh, the beam so you can get the image. So the, so what I saw at least ten or fifteen years ago had a lot of flicker in it. It, it. it was not kind of a display that you would want to have as your computer terminal. Maybe for yeah. you know for yeah, building yeah, but this this type of display actually uses a, a vector drawing. Uh, with oh, really? The, oh, so it's much and, so, and so it's uh, that's not a raster scan. Yes, not a raster display. Right. And again, it's monochrome, and uh, uh, other than the vector drawing, it's not very high resolution. Right. Yeah. So I don't think you're going to see those. You're going to see those things uh, anytime soon. Uh, we have a question from Rich Yeager. So let me let me ask the other question, which is, uh, how do we make cryptocurrency with uh, the lasers that are available? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, just kidding, just kidding. Well, you use uh, hypermodulation of uh, different lights and <laughs> dream on, right? I am <laughs> but you know, I, I, I think the laser field, if, if you, you know, I, I, I got into laser, uh, it, it, laser field was very hot in 1960s because this is where first lasers were demonstrated. And literally every year, uh, people were coming with new kind of structures. I got into, uh, I went to grad school in 1972, where there were, the, the field was, was kind of hot. I left in 1977, and you could see that the, the field was maturing and starting to, uh, to uh, the, the creativity was kind of getting, uh, at least in gas lasers, was, it was leveling off. Uh, when I left, the hot thing were these excitement, la excitement lasers, which, which I talked about, uh, and uh, free electron laser. Free electron laser was something that uh, I saw pictures of, and I, when I saw it, I thought the guy who who created this device had to be a madman, because the investment just to build the device. You know, it's, it's, it's so huge. So he had to convince so many people to, to fund it. And the probability of it not working was probably really high. <laughs> so, so he, he, he was, I, you know, I, I'm in awe of the guy. And I'm not in awe of the concept. But uh, the laser field then in, in the 1980s became more of a solid state type of uh, uh, field where you know the uh, laser diodes basically started showing up, and all kinds of variants of laser diodes started showing up. Uh, but I was at that point I was already out of the field. We we actually now have problems with lasers because people use those uh, small relatively small lasers to blind airplanes, uh, and it's becoming a problem been a problem for a while and uh, you can get a, a visit from the uh, cops in a big hurry if you do that kind of stuff in your backyard right <laughs> so yeah i and I, I i put something in chat but back to what what was just talked about in terms of of uh lasered for displays is our lasers part of that whole display mechanism that they use to cover the holiday displays on like whole big buildings like Saks fifth avenue I have no idea how they put all of that light up there and make make uh, moving pictures and stuff. But they, that's a that's a big big display just using the building as a uh, as a screen, so to speak. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think if you want to see some impressive impressive lasers, go to Disney World. They, oh yeah, they have some some displays with them. 
Anything with entertainment value takes us right. about two nanoseconds to Disney for Disney to pick up on it. Yep. Right. I I would expect that the uh, dis displays in Times Square are LEDs, not uh, not not laser pr projection. And for one thing, it's pretty dangerous to be sending that beam across the street. Uh, you, yeah. You don't want such a high energy thing in such a public area. Well, Griff, the, certainly most of the uh, stuff in, in Times Square is, is defined, LA, defined space LED. I'm talking about the ones where they project it on the side of a building, like Saks Fifth Avenue, for instance. That, you know, that, that's yeah. 10 stories high, and it's, there's nothing coming. There's nothing on the building that is causing that. It's, it's in some projection <laughs> from somewhere. <laughs> possible what i've seen or the last time i saw it which might have been uh five or six years ago it was basically it looked more like a um a projection an optical projection as opposed to a a laser uh projection and uh they might be using a white laser to generate the light to project but it what didn't seem to be a uh, a raster display or a direct laser display. Yeah. Okay. That makes um, sense. If if we have no more questions, I'd like to thank John for a very enlightening talk. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. And, <laughs> and some very interesting questions. And um uh, since it's such a nice day outside, I think we should go outside and get some photon stimulated emission from outside. Just make sure it's not too many of them. <laughs> and, and, and let Joel go home. You know? okay. I believe it's I am home. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. give Joel a break here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank take, you. Take it was fun. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.